Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of Let's Talk here on Win TV. I'm your host, Denise Rollard Barnes, publisher of the Washington Informer. And today we have a great lineup of guests for you, but let me first apologize for starting a few minutes late. You know, these technical problems, I don't know what's going on. Maybe it's still part of the, um, what do we have earlier this week? The um, eclipse, this uh, solar eclipse. Maybe that's still impacting technology. I don't know. But anyway, we're here. I'm glad to have you with us. Thanks for being patient, particularly to our, our guests. We have a great group of guests today. I'm so excited to have uh, Joseph Lightman Santa Cruz, who is sponsoring our first segment uh, of Let's Talk. And he is the CEO and executive director of the Capital Area uh, Asset Builders otherwise known as CAB. Uh, so he is coming in to give us some last minute tips as for those of you all who have not gotten those taxes done uh, and some things that you can do to save a little money, maybe get a little bit of money back. Uh, but he's going to be here to talk about us, talk to us, talk about us if we haven't gotten them done, but talk to us uh, because you know that deadline is coming up on Monday, April the 15th. So we want to make sure you get your taxes done on time and to do it the best way you can. And next, our health reporter, Linda Way Villacazzi, will talk to Dr. Colby Chapman Tyson about the mental health challenges facing Black children and youth and shed light on important issues that need attention, need our attention. And Candace Jones, president and CEO of the Public Welfare Foundation, will take the stage with us in our third segment discussing the importance of supporting Black-led nonprofits, criminal justice reform, and community safety through local organizations. Great to have these folks with us. And last but not least, my friend and Shiro uh, in the DMV, Rosalind Stiles, will be with us along with Dottie Love Wade to talk about Jobs Not Guns, an initiative that they have started, a successful initiative, to look at other insights on how to decrease gun violence and promote safer communities. So I'm so excited to have these guests with us and I hope that you will watch the entire program if possible to gain some tips on what we can do to grow our communities. I wanna congratulate the first and second place winners of the 2024 Citywide Spelling Bee, which was held uh, actually earlier, but it was broadcast on Tuesday on, um, what is it, the DC, I think it's DCN, uh, the local uh, uh, municipal channel for the District of Columbia. And uh, if you go online or go on YouTube, you'll get a chance to see the spelling bee. But we're excited that Noah Rowe, an eighth grader from McFarland Middle School became our first place winner. And Nora Baker, a sixth grader from Basis DC um, School uh, was our second place winner. I mean, these are some spelling kids, all of them, all 30, I think it was 32 of them that participated in the DC Citywide Spelling Bee are amazing, are amazing uh, young students, um, scholars in their own right, uh, athletes, um, artists. Um, they do a lot of different things. They live very holistic lives, but they know how to spell those words. So uh, wish them well as, uh, um, as, Noah, uh, our first place winner, goes to the Scripps National Spelling Bee uh, in June. He will be competing uh, against more than probably 200 uh, young people uh, between the, between third and the the third and eighth grades across the country for the National Spelling Bee uh, Championship. That's a tough one. You all know it's really tough, and uh, some of these young spellers are just it's 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 more exciting sometimes than watching. Well, no. People might debate me if I was going to say the Super Bowl or the uh, NBA finals or whatever, but it's still an exciting and exciting competition. Um, in addition, I hope you have picked up a copy of this week's Washington Informer. Uh, this is it. And as a matter of fact, we in, on the inside, oops, where is it? Right there. Uh, we have our spelling bee insert. So if you've picked up a copy, you know, I always like to show the newspaper. Uh, to show that, yes, we are still printing a publication. Uh, and we will do that so long as there is demand for it because we know digital is, is beginning to take over. But some of us just like to fill that ink uh, or those pages between our fingers. We like to turn pages. And so, um, and we like producing the newspaper. We like seeing people out there reading the Washington Informer. So 
pick up a copy of the informant. As I said, our spelling bee section is on the inside. So you can take a look at that and see all of the wonderful spellers who participated this year. This is kind of an example of who they are. Uh, so uh, you'll get a chance to read that story. And maybe you might even want to support Washington Informant Charities. You can always do that uh, because uh, the charities is the one that sponsors the spelling bee. And uh, this is marks our 40 second year. Can you believe it? We've been sponsoring the Spelling Bee and the DMV for 42 years and looking forward to doing it for 42 more. Please share today's broadcast on your social media platforms and follow us on Facebook, IG, X, TikTok, Threads, Nextdoor, LinkedIn, and YouTube. We are where you are. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, at Washington Informer TV, that's one word, no spaces, Washington Informer TV. And we ask you, as I said, subscribe because those numbers help. We are probably close to about 850 now. I'm not sure what the number is, Chevy, but we're trying to get uh, to that 1000 mark. Uh, we love to be able to surpass it. But if you're watching, uh, if you have friends that you think uh, would enjoy some of the broadcasts that we do, some of the folks that we talk to, ask them to sign up and to subscribe to the Washington Informer. We certainly would love to have you as a part of our family. So we're gonna move on next uh, to our news broadcast by Curtis Knowles, and I'll be back on the other side. This is Curtis Knowles with Win TV News. Bills providing financial aid to workers affected by the disruption at Baltimore's ports and another that formally renames the facility were signed into law by Governor Westmore on Tuesday. Both were included with more than 120 bills that received more signature, including House Bill 375 and its identical companion SB 156, which formally renamed the port in honor of Helen DeLeach Bentley. More comments to saying, quote, that the bill will create a new permanent scholarship program for the families of transportation workers who died on the job, as well as this legislation will allow for more flexibility in work search requirements for unemployment insurance, as the legislation will empower our administration to stay nimble and our future responses to collapse. Mayor Bowser went to Anacostia to tout the city's new AAD rebate program. If someone goes into cardiac arrest, the difference between dying and surviving can be an AED machine or an automated external defibrillator. Those that are eligible can buy an AED and then apply for a rebate worth up to $400, which is about half the cost of an AED. Multiple purchases can lead up to a $750 rebate. Citywide, the survival rate from cardiac arrest is above the national average, but the numbers also show a noticeable racial disparity. Bowser commented saying, quote, the program which we're calling the AED incentive program will be open to small businesses, places of worship, small unit apartment buildings and nonprofit organizations. The Environmental Protection Agency has announced strict limits on dangerous and harmful forever chemicals in drinking water. Many local water utilities are now seeing how these new regulations will affect their operations. The new standard is a maximum containment level of four parts per trillion for some of the PFAS chemicals. That's about one drop of water in five Olympic sized swimming pools. PFAS are chemicals linked to increased risk for a host of health issues, including certain cancers, liver disease, and low birth weight. The WSSC Water is expecting to open a new lab in the fall that will be testing for these PFASs. Thank you so very much, Curtis. And so now it is my pleasure to, one, acknowledge the fact that this segment is brought to you by uh, CAB which is the, why am I blowing a blank here, Chevrolet? Capital, Capital Area Asset <laughs> Builders. Joseph, please forgive me. <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> good afternoon, Denise, how's it going? Yeah, good, good. Let's say that again. This segment is brought to you by the Capital Area Asset Builders. So I uh, wanna thank you so much for being with us and for, uh, hey, getting us on point with getting these taxes done. What's new? Uh, well, good afternoon again, Denise. And, and I always love to first say thank you for the empowerment that the Washington Informer always brings to the community. Uh, we need your voice to be heard. And that's why for uh, five plus years, while I have been leading CAV, uh, I have been very proud to be partnering with the Washington Informer. Um, CAV is a 28-year-old DC-based nonprofit organization that focuses on pro providing access to economic mobility and wealth creation, primarily for low-income, black and brown Washingtonians and community members throughout the DMV. And today we are here to really talk about how we only have three more days to focus on taxes. And usually, Denise, anytime we talk about taxes, come on, let's be honest, it's a, it's a headache. 
Uh, it, it's, it's problematic, it's complex, but there's one specific area of the tax code that is actually beneficial to low to moderate income community members, and that is the earned income tax credit. The EITC for more than four decades has been the most effective poverty alleviation public policy that we have in this nation. And in the District of Columbia, there is a state level EITC earned income tax credit that provides a 70% match. So for families that generated below $64,000 in 2023, this is whether you work for a week, a month, the full year, whether you were a W-2 employee, whether you were a 1099 contractor, whether you were delivering uh, food through Uber Eats or delivering anything through one of the gig economy um, platforms, please note that if you earn any kind of income last year, you may qualify for up to $12,000 from both Uncle Sam and the DC government. And I always love to highlight, Denise, that this is not a public benefit. This is your money that temporarily is being held on by Uncle Sam and the DC government until you take the step of filing a tax form and getting your money. So we love to say at CAB, it's your money and get it back. And that is why, Denise, we love to partner with the Washington Informer because we're talking about more than 40,000 Washingtonians are impacted by the earned income tax credit every year. And every year we can be seeing more than $180 million coming in. However, we estimate at CAV that about 20,000 EITC eligible Washingtonian families, primarily in wards five, seven, and eight, are missing out on more than 40 million bucks. Imagine wow. Denise, what financial empowerment could exist in the district if 40 million bucks are primarily coming in to low income black and brown families. So that is why we need for everybody to be fully aware that the need to file a tax form ain't the same as paying taxes. There are too many of our community members who do not file a tax form because they believe that they did not earn enough money to pay taxes. While you do not owe any taxes to Uncle Sam, Uncle Sam and Uncle DC government may owe you thousands of dollars. So that is why we need to make sure that everybody files a tax form. And we have launched a website, thanks to the support with the District of Columbia Department of Insurance, Securities and Banking, DISB. And the website is getyoureitc.org. Getyoureitc.org. Please visit the website. You will get more information about the federal EITC, the District of Columbia EITC. And right now, you will also get information on where you can go to get your taxes done for free. And Denise, let's be honest, you and I have talked about this, that anytime we hear the word free, we're always asking what's in it for them. Why are they doing it? What, what's the hidden fee? In this case, there's no hidden. This is a high quality, trusted, free tax preparation mechanism that is either available in person or you can upload information online. What matters the most is for folks to take the initiative of empowering themselves and taking the step of actually filing a tax form. So Joseph, I didn't want to cut you off at all because every sentence that you that you said was important. It's important for people to know and understand, and I appreciate that. I do have a couple, every time we talk, I have another question about this because one, I'm glad that you come back again to share this information with us. But what happens if a person has actually been unemployed for the past year, uh, but they still, you know, feel as though they need to uh, file their taxes? Does Is this... Uh, credit still available to them? So we, we always emphasize, Denise, that uh, anyone and everyone, regardless of what type of income was generated last year, should be filing a tax form with both the IRS at the federal level and with the state jurisdiction. And in the District of Columbia, that would be the Office of Tax and Revenue. For folks who were unemployed for the whole year, and if they receive unemployment insurance benefits, right. unfortunately, mm -hmm. that's a taxable situation. So they may have to pay taxes on the unemployment. However, if they have children and if they are qualifying for the earned income tax credit, they would not only not have to pay any taxes, they may be eligible for a significant refund, both from the federal government and the DC government. That's why we're always urging folks to take the step of filing your taxes. And Denise, something else that we always need to highlight, 
is that if by any chance you miss the April 15th deadline, do not worry. You still have more time to file taxes. The only big difference is that if you owe money to the government, then there might be penalties and interest that accumulate. So the faster, the sooner you file your taxes, the better. If you miss out the April 15th deadline and the governments owe you money, well, that money will be held on until you take the step of filing a tax form. When it comes to taxes, the tax case is kept open for three years. So we're urging folks, take the step right now, not only with 2023, but you can take the action of filing your taxes for 2022, 2021, and 2020. This April 15th will nice. be the last time that you will be eligible to get any money that is owed to you for 2020. As we like to say, let's empower the community and let's not give more money to governments because we trust the community more than we trust the federal government. So let's make sure that that money through the EATC comes into the community. One other question, Joseph, before we go. <clears throat> so if you uh, receive the um, uh, earned income tax credit, let's say in 2023 or 2022, um, well, I don't know what year, but is that considered income? Do you have to end up paying taxes on the credit? Or how does the government look at that income that you receive? Fortunately, that is a tax credit. So it's your money being given back to you. So it's not considered taxable income. And something else that we're about to close the window on, Denise, is during the pandemic, there was an expansion only for one year for the federal child tax credit. And folks will have only this window of an opportunity to still get your 2020 child tax credit. And that meant up to $3,600 for any children below the age of six and up to $3,000 for children ages six to 17. So again, it is always your money. Uncle Sam is just holding on to it. You have to go get it. I have a friend, a fellow publisher in California, who always talks about, you know, when we were kids, I, I don't know if you did this, Joseph, but you know, my, my dad used to always uh, allow us to, to clean, wash, wash his car. And we did it because there was always change in the seats. <laughs> or, you know, you're sitting on the sofa and the money falls out your pockets and there's always a uh, change in the couch. This is our change in the government. This is the money that sort of dropped. It didn't drop out. It's there for us. We just have to go get it. And I think that's what you're trying to communicate to our viewers. Go get that money. It's sitting there for you. It's changing. It's, and for some, it's more than change. It's really good cash in the couch. Uh, so I appreciate you being with us and sharing this great news with us. Um, again, if you could just remind us of, I know that you said, I mean, April 15th is our, tax deadline, but we still can file afterwards. Could you just re re reiterate that again? Yeah, please visit getyoureitc.org. That's the website that CAV launched. Information on the federal and DC EITC and links for you to still get your taxes done for free in person in different portions of the district or online. So again, multiple ways for you to get done your taxes on time. After April 15th, the services will be a lot more limited, but you can still be filing your taxes. But again, if you owe taxes to the government, you will have to pay additional interest, additional penalties. But if the government owes you money, you can still be claiming that down the road. But again, we want you to maximize your money. So do make sure that by the end of April 15th, so until 11.59 p.m., on this coming Monday, you can still go to getyoureitc.org to file your taxes for free in a high quality and trusted way. Joseph Lightman Santa Cruz of CAB, Capital Area Asset Builders. Thank you so very much for being with us and for sponsoring this segment. Look forward to having you back to talk about some other money growing, money saving issues. Sounds great. Thank you, right. Denise. Okay. Okay. Same to you. So now we're going to bring in Linda Way Valakazi, who's going to, I'm going to turn the program over to her. She's our health reporter, and uh, she will take on, or introduce our next guest. Thank you so much, Denise. Thanks, Lindy. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. 
So today we'd like to shed some light on the mental health challenges of today's black children and youth and how the parents and adults in their lives can provide the support that they need to be mentally healthy. So joining us today, we have Dr. Colby Tyson with us, who is the Associate Medical Director of Inpatient Psychiatric Services at Children's National Hospital here in DC, where she works with youth hospitalized in the inpatient psychiatric units. So thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Tyson. Oh, no, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me here today. Absolutely. So regarding your work at Children's National Hospital, mm -hmm. um, when you look at children specifically, mm -hmm. what are you seeing uh, of the issues that are coming through your doors? And how may some of these issues vary based on a child being Black in the district? No, absolutely. And that's that's a great question. I'm really glad we're talking about this because our youth are navigating significant struggles related to their mental health um, and really in a world with significant changes, stressors and quite frankly, unfiltered accessibility that creates a, a whole different type of vulnerability that maybe previous generations have not had. So when we look at the issues that our youth are dealing with. Um, well, first, it's hard to encapsulate that in just a few words, but I'll try. Um, but essentially what we're seeing is we're seeing more youth, number one, just even coming into the emergency room for mental health needs. And then we're seeing a higher amount of them requiring psychiatric admission. Then on top of that, once they're here, what we're seeing, we're seeing this increased level of severity in what they're dealing with. So we're seeing higher levels of suicidality. We're seeing suicide attempts outside the hospital, but also inside the hospital now. We're seeing higher levels of violence, aggression, severe anxiety, sometimes to a point where they struggle with even going to school and lots of school refusal, isolation. Um, I think something that's standing out even more is that we're not just seeing suicide connected to longstanding difficulties where we have all these warning signs leading up to it. We're also now seeing teens with no formal psychiatric history who are just struggling to cope with what's going on in the world, feeling alone, dealing with bullying, intense stressors, trauma. And suicide has now kind of become this way of solving this problem and this overwhelming distress that they're dealing with to end these painful emotions. So we're seeing a lot of that. And then on top of that, severe substance use. So we take that and look at that in the context. So the issues that we're seeing they're dealing with in the context is uncertainty of their future. As our country is dealing with political, legislative changes, things related to LGBTQ plus rights, women's rights, racial inequities, systemic, systemic racism, gun violence, school shootings, and just kind of list goes on and on. Then you add on top of what that what kids are dealing with, the trauma, the poverty, family conflict, lack of appropriate resources and investment in mental health. So that's kind of what we see as the issues. And then if we kind of go into the black community, they're dealing with all of this. And then on top of that, we also know there's disparities that there's evidence for that within the systems that also affect their mental health. So this is related to accessing mental health care accurate diagnoses, right? Some youth are more likely to get a certain diagnosis when they present with psychosis versus others. Um, we also know disciplinary action versus referral to mental health care within the school systems. All of this continues to contribute to the mental health of our Black youth. Um, and so we are now also seeing increasing rates of suicidality in our Black youth rapidly increasing. So those are the issues that we're seeing in general and also down into the, the Black youth as well. Wow. No, I thank you for that answer, because it, when you explain that, it sounds like there's an underlying uh, consistency of trauma that mm -hmm. so much of the youth is experiencing. Um, a lot of people experience loss during COVID, a host of issues that were exacerbated during that time. And it just continues now. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when we see the level, the rising level of gun violence around um, our communities, um, people who are losing family members, whether it's natural causes or health disparities. Um, is there anything that sticks mm -hmm. out to you in how you see children and youth respond to death, uh, yeah. whether they're experiencing loss in their families or seeing death around them in their communities? Absolutely. So we know that navigating death, loss, grief is can be very unique to the person and everyone processes these things in a different way. And it can be very complicated for you based upon what their lived experience to date has already been. And so when we look at even death within the family, right? This can stir up all types of emotions. It can be guilt, rage, sadness, hopelessness. There can be some relief. And many times it's all mixed up together for a youth to try to figure out how do I understand this and what's going on with me? It can be overwhelming. There's also what I've noticed 
that stands out is this experience of the loss in the day to day within the family dynamics that sometimes we don't pay attention to. Right. A lot of times the person who we've lost in that family had a specific role, whether they were the mediator, the protector, the confidant for that child. That role is now vacant in that child's life. And they're scrambling, trying to understand how they move through big milestones in their lives. So one of the things I really want to tell, remind people is that grief is not just right after the event. It will come at different milestones in a child's life when they're noticing that person would have been here or this role would have been filled. And so we see that. Um, but then we also know that death can also affect the community. And within a community, it can bring up similar emotions to an individual because it reminds them of different situations close to them. We also know that it can bring fear into a community, depending on how that death occurred um, and fear that a child might lose someone else in their life. But then we also have to acknowledge that there are times where death is a day to day experience for some youth because they see it every single day, whether it's due to violence, whether it's due to illness. And to them, it they can come off more disconnected to it. And just matter of fact, this is what life is. So every youth experience is different. And we have to keep that in mind when we're working with them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, we've also seen widespread concern of the rise in crime and also rates of youth violence in the city. Um, and I'm just always under the belief that there's typically some underlying issues that are happening, usually from the family units or uh, just their home life in general, that kind of encourage neg negative mentality or behavior in adolescent uh, life. So, um, what are some of the background circumstances that you're seeing in young patients that may negatively affect their levels of depression or anxiety or even adverse behavior? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you see a lot in the youth that we work with. And so some of what I've seen that definitely we see negatively impacts their, their mental health outcomes, poverty within the and within the family household lack of access to just even basic needs right i'm thinking about some of my my patients who were trying to support them with their mental health but there's no electricity and that's interfering with their sleep which is affecting their bipolar disorder and causing them to go into a manic episode right it all can connect um we see lack of their ability to be engaged in activities that support mastery outside of just the school setting right some of our youth struggle academically but that's the only thing that the, the world is focused on is, are they smart enough in school? But we're not looking at mastery in other areas of their life to help build their confidence and their esteem. Um, so we see some of our youth not having access to that or not being able to be engaged in it. Lower level supervision in the home. Um, and this is not just because the parent is neglectful, right? This is sometimes because the parent is working three or four jobs, working overnight to kind of manage that economic stress that the family is dealing with, or they are dealing with their own mental health or their own physical health that they're navigating as well. We see a lot of trauma within those families um, that have gone through generations that then affect kind of how the youth and the parent are interacting and the conflict that then come in it. So those are some of the different things that we'll see that can affect our youth's mental health, but it's within the family um, kind of bubbling underneath the surface that we gotta also pay attention to. Sure, sure. And you know, when you're working with the youth, every mm -hmm. approach varies depending on the child that you're working with, but are there any baseline tips or practices that you introduce to children to kind of help them manage their mental and emotional health? You know, whether it is mm -hmm. depression or anger, or just what kind of things can they take with them to practice? Yeah. So you're right. Every, every child's treatment is unique in how we approach and how we work with them. Um, but when I look at some of the baseline things that I want to really help our youth walk away with, especially when they come to see us in the hospital, number one is first self-validation and how we first acknowledge that what you're feeling, what you're experiencing can make sense in the context of what your life and your world and your environment looks like and your experiences you've had to date. Because sometimes our youth are walking around feeling like no one understands them, feeling like they're wrong for having these emotions, feeling like people are telling them just be happy. Why can't I be happy? So some of the skills we first just start off with is how can we just validate what you're experiencing is real 
and make sense and make understanding of it for you to then figure out then how do we start recovering? How do we start healing? So we do that through a variety of different ways, kind of looking at emotions, getting our teens to talk about emotions, trying to teach them how do we lean into your emotions to understand what is it communicating as opposed to how do we as, as opposed to avoiding them and not understanding them. So those are some of the initial skills. We'll also talk about what are your overarching goals? What's important to you? Because some of our youth have been handed a and a life that has been stressful and traumatic from the start. So how do we help you identify what would make it worth being alive? What would be important to you? And then how do we look at what does that look like in a recovery? So we talk to youth and we help them kind of think about those things. Um, and then on top of that, building in different relaxation um, techniques, mindfulness techniques, uh, education about what is going on with them. So there's some of the things we try to help our youth with. And if you really look at the overarching theme, I would say is we're trying to reinstill hope because this process takes time. Depression and anxiety does not go away overnight. So instilling some level of hope to have them hold on and use different skills to manage is, is what we like to do um, in general with our youth. Awesome, and healing is definitely a process and being able to relearn how to pattern your life um, based on what you've experienced before. So understandable. And before we let you go, um, in terms of the parents and the adults around them, what can parents and other adults who are involved do to help balance their children's mental and emotional health? And are there certain things that parents can look out for to gauge and address how their children are feeling? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, 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 it's going to sound more simple than what it is because it's actually quite challenging because as caregivers and adults, we are also human. We also have our own emotions. We have our own experiences that influence how we view stress and how we cope with stress. And so I would say the first thing I talk to parents and caregivers about is how do we make sure your narrative does not become your child's narrative, right? And that means you have to listen to them first. Even if you don't agree, listen to what they're experiencing, hear how it is in stress before we try to fix it, before we try to tell them our stories of, well, you should be able to do this because I did this, because our world is different than ours was. Um, so really talking to parents about what does it mean to listen and validate that child's experience, that it is different, hearing that other perspective, um, and then also trying to help them lean, also help them lean into emotions, not telling them just think you should be happy or this needs to get fixed, helping them understand these are real emotions because life is full of both beautiful, wonderful experiences and stress and struggles. And we have to help our youth learn how to tolerate and navigate those things. So I talked to parents about how to just listen. Um, and then on top of that, creating space, for them. And so finding time to just connect with your youth, it doesn't mean you're asking them constantly about their mental health, but just having that space available where you're spending time with them. So if something's coming up, they can share that with you. They can bring that up with you. Um, and then also just as, a, as caregivers, acknowledging that we're not perfect and that we may need to support ourselves to support our youth, right? There are things we've experienced as adults that are influencing the choices we make for our youth. And it's okay to say that we need support too. Um, so in that, as far as what parents can do or what to look for, kind of looking for youth um, when they might be isolating or they might be kind of rebelling or behaving in ways that don't make sense. That should be a signal to you. If they're behaving in ways that don't quite make sense to me, Perhaps it's not that they're a bad kid. Perhaps it's not that they're just trying to make my life more difficult. That might be a sign that something is happening with your child or there's something they're not understanding about themselves that they're trying to navigate. And so using that as a warning sign. Um, also, we're noticing them isolating or if they're changing behaviors, they, you know, things that they used to enjoy and like to do, um, if they're seeming more confused or if they are um, Sometimes teens are telling us in different ways. I'm having a hard time. And when they're telling you, you're stressing me out. Well, maybe that's all they know how to explain to you. But instead of taking that personally, say, OK, what is my what are the vulnerabilities in my child right now? What are they dealing with is making them more vulnerable in this state to help them address that? So those would be some of the suggestions that I would have for parents and caregivers. Awesome. I appreciate your insights so much. This has been so informative and we hope to have you back soon because we definitely plan to continue to talk about this issue and how we can help our youth. 
Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Tyson. You're welcome. I'm looking forward to being back. Absolutely. And now we'll hand it back to Denise. Thank you. There I am. <laughs> Thank you, Linda Way. Uh, that was quite an informative uh, interview. And it's, uh, it's something we need to pay a lot of attention to because a lot of parents just don't know first what the signs are and two, don't know where to secure help. So I'm glad that uh, the doctor was with us today and uh, look forward to hearing more. Absolutely. No, All thank right. you for having me. Yeah, sure. We'll, yeah, you'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. So it's a pleasure now for me to bring on the president and CEO of the Public Welfare uh, Foundation, Candace Jones. Uh, Candace, welcome to Let's Talk. Oh, it's nice to be with you. How are you doing? Oh, hey, you know, there's some elements going on out here. We've had some uh, technical problems and all that, but, you know, we're, we're pushing forward. So I can say I'm doing well. Doing well. I love that. Well, that's <laughs> what we need. We, we just need that can-do energy, right? That's right. That's right. So thank you for joining us, you know, and, t and coming to bring us information about the Public Welfare Foundation. Tell me what, what the organization's about, your mission, your vision. Yeah, we're a foundation. So we're a foundation in the traditional sense, which is that we exist to give money to other organizations that do good. Specifically, we're a foundation that gives money around a strategic pillar of criminal and youth justice reform. So we fund in sites all over the country and we fund groups that focus on advancing justice with a focus on really investing deeply in communities of color and with formerly incarcerated people two groups that tend to be starved out of the resources to advance this issue. We like to make sure that they are around the, com around the table, driving the conversation, informing where we go. We work in DC, Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana, Oklahoma, Colorado, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Michigan, and we just this year launched work in Tennessee. Well, this is, uh, this is good news. I mean, I've heard of the Public Welfare Foundation, didn't know much about your work, and uh, and so glad that you decided to come and share this information with us. I have a lot of questions, but uh, I have to ask to a certain extent, you know, what what made you feel as though, you know, this was information you needed to share with our viewers? We think it's really important to talk about this work, particularly in this moment in history. I was so interested and intrigued by your last panel about youth mental health. We have all these powerful and engaging topics that we're grappling with with right now. I, before I was at Public Welfare, ran a youth prison system. We worked uh, at the time when I was running the system, more than 50% of those youth had co-occurring disorders, either a mental health issue or substance abuse issue that they were dealing with. And it's a testament to what we do as a society when kids are in free fall, when they're struggling. We tend to use suppression and incarceration as the way to respond to that, not the sort of nurturing support that Dr. Tyson was talking about in the last segment. And so much of what public welfare is trying to be in discussion with, in society, with the advocates that we work with is to say, is this really the way we want to respond to these crises? It's also just so important for us to be in the discussion right now because there can be a lack of great information. I love that interview, but a big misconception in the district is actually that youth have been driving violent crime and actually the data doesn't support that. By and large, it's not our youth, it's not our young people that are at the crux of that issue. The average age of those involved in either as a perpetrator or as a victim of gun violence is 27 years old, so a much older individual. And so we have to think about that because that data both helps us think about how we need to respond to that group of individuals to wrap them in the supportive services that keeps them out of risk, but particularly how we think about our young people with the mental health supports and additional supports they will need to get on track. Yeah, whether, you know, as you know how folks are, are I mean, whether youth are driving uh, those numbers or not, it's the type of uh, criminal activity that we keep hearing about, you yeah. know, um, um, you know, attacks on, on seniors or attacks on each other. And the younger the age causes us to pause and say, yeah. whoa, what's going on? I mean, it may right. only be one or two incidents, but to, it's enough to make us feel like it's a crisis. So, but, but with regards to what the uh, Public Welfare Foundation does, I mean, what kind of um, projects or organizations 
does the foundation fund? What do you look for when you're thinking about people or organizations to support? We will fund in a site that we're focused on a myriad of issues. So in DC, we'll use that as an example because we're talking about it. We fund those organizations that do policy work, the DC Justice Labs, Thrive Under 25, School Justice Project, Free Minds, Literary Clubs. We will also fund some of the intervention programs that are working with higher risk youth, um, the Trigger Project and programs like that. We'll fund media. We were funders of WAMU and the DCS, those groups that are telling the story of justice reform. You know, this is so important to your point. I think the perception of crime is such a powerful thing and something that has to be acknowledged. We just want to make sure that people are being armed with great information in our sites. So then when they go to say, this is what should be responsive to that, they actually have a real handle on what's really going on. So we fund local media beats on the issue that talk about that issue. So we really will, in a site that we've seen as the one that we want to focus on, fund everything up to and including the research and data analysis that helps us really have a handle on what's happening in that site. I'm going to get personal for a minute because um, in 19, see the paper, Washington Forum was started in 64. So in 1974, uh, my dad started the United Black Fund. I love and that. he started that organization because he found that there were a lot of small nonprofits in the District of Columbia that were doing great work. But and one, they didn't have their 501c3, didn't have their um, all their tax, uh, what do you call it, legal documents in no. place that were doing great work, yeah. but just didn't have the things in place to help them to get the money that they needed to continue the, the work. UBF stepped in in that regard to help them to get those documents and to give them their initial funding to get started. Yeah. Um, do you still find that to be an issue? Um, you know, Because uh, you can mention, we look at those that may get funding, they tend to be larger organizations with you know, bigger budgets already and the smaller ones that are actually on the ground, you know, what would you have, what would you say to them if they were interested in applying? What I will say is that your father was unfortunately a visionary because exactly what he observed back in 74 still exists in philanthropy writ large. There was a bridge pan study that they did with Echo and Green back in 2020, where they show that Black, Latinx, people of color led organizations got cents on the dollars of philanthropic to support their work across a myriad of issues. So I think there's now a research base that supports what he knew at that time. Public welfare works to address that. We're really intentional, as I said, when, I, when we're talking about our sites, we prioritize formerly incarcerated leaders, people of color leaders, some of the organizations I named like DC Justice Lab. We didn't come in and fund DC Justice Lab once it was big. We were one of the original organizations that helped launch it. We like to be first in and catalytic folks with ideas, recognizing that these communities, people of color do incredible work and they need to have agency in the conversation. They can't just be somebody we wheel out when we want to hear a voice or have testify. They actually need to be a part of running the organizations. We also, with your dad, I mean, he was ahead of his time. It's not just enough to sometimes give grants. What we find is that we have to wrap them with the kind of support that allows them to get technical assistance about how do you finalize your 501c3. If you're not ready to get a 501c3, maybe what you need is a partnership with a fiscal sponsor that can do some of your back office and administrative work while you go out and do the good work until you're ready to actually move in that direction. So that is a big part of the work. And I would like to be able to tell you that decades later, we have figured that out. But the truth is that there's still not enough philanthropic organizations like ours that are trying to be really intentional about that. You know, it's also one of the things that I've seen over the years, and I don't know how you all feel about uh, this in your in your um, in, in giving grants or funding programs, is collaborations. You know, sometimes we as as a group of people want to be the the one and only. Oh but my sometimes, goodness. and you mentioned the partnerships and collaborations. How someone that might have all of those things. Um, uh, you can partner with them so that you add something to talk a little bit about collaborate, collaborating. I mean, you, I'm going to try not to jump down a rabbit hole, but there's so <laughs> much rich, there's so much rich discussion there, as you well know. Yeah. There are all kinds of things smaller organizations can do to cut overhead. One of the things we do is we're at the True Reformer building 
at on U Street. Yes. And we have some of our nonprofits that we fund. They actually have a floor in our building. So they don't have to pay rent, which cuts their overhead. Some of their costs is carry or share. Even if organizations are not doing that with a foundation partner, being able to come together and pool some of their administrative costs, their human resources, their operations and overhead can generate huge savings so that they can really focus on their programmatic mission. The other thing is that, and this is what really excites me about your set, is that there's such power in collaborating, right? The strongest work is usually advanced, not by individuals or one organizations, but through coalitions. So one of the groups that we've worked on funding in the district is the Thrive Under 25 Coalition. There's a youth justice coalition that's run out of Georgetown. Uh, the Justice Policy Institute did a coalition on emerging adults. This idea that they're bringing a bunch of stakeholders together with a shared mission to say, what do we need to do, you know, as Dr. Tyson was talking about, to address this issue writ large and how can all of our organizations line up together and think about what we not what we need to do and then employ a collective strategy. So I think across all verticals, you know, it's not a cliche. We're stronger together. Mm -hmm. And I think organizations that aren't really leveraging that is an opportunity loss. So how do folks really uh, get into, I don't want to put it this way, but I am, how do they get into the uh, public welfare foundation pocket? <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> They people can apply. One of the things we did a couple of years ago is that we opened up our letter of interest. Some foundations are invite only. I will be frank. A lot of the organizations that we fund, we fund by uh, invite. We go through and we know the one thing that folks have to understand is we are hyper focused on criminal and youth justice reform. Okay. We're not doing a lot of ancillary issues. We plan at our feet. And so we get a lot of solicitations from folks that are working on something that feels a little far afield. If you're not in that space, we're not going to fund you. But we leave that LOI open because we take the position that the full universe of organizations out there, we don't know. And so organizations can reach out to us and apply. They will see on our LOI page on the website what our funding priorities are, and they can understand better what we work on and apply and let us know what they're working on. I am so excited that you were here to talk to us today. I think we're going to probably consider a program uh, at some point on uh, philanthropy. You know, okay. the other thing I find is that, I mean, people think that black folks are always on the receiving end, but I think research, and maybe you can confirm this, is that we do a pretty good job at donating as well. Can you yes. uh, talk a little bit about that? There's some pretty prominent uh, black philanthropists. You'll recall a couple of years ago when a prominent black donor paid every Morehouse student's college tuition. Mm -hmm. He actually is a major donor in a couple of different spaces. There are both big donors who are giving their resources and also some pretty senior leadership at some of the prominent philanthropic organizations across the country. And there's some amazing black female uh, philanthropic leaders right here in the district. So I think that would be, uh, yeah, I'd love to be a part of that conversation because I also think it's important to demystify the field for our community because I always tell people, I didn't know what philanthropy was until I graduated from law school. Right. And I think that that's sad. You don't know how to access, you know, it can be a very sort of Byzantine secret space. And I think a conversation like that informs, which is what you guys do better than anybody. Well, we know that one place we do know where philanthropy exists and that's in, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the church. Yes. Oh, Sunday morning. That's right. <laughs> we That's right. Times. That's a form right. of and Listen, <laughs> you know better than I do. So it's a Sunday morning, but if it's a really good uh, practitioner church, it's all week long, seven days. <laughs> I got you. So, uh, so Candace, I, I mean, our time's running short. I want to make sure that we've gotten to the things that you wanted to actually share with us. Is there anything we're missing? No, I just think it's incredible opportunity. We have published a couple of reports about justice reform in collaboration with an organization, um, the Criminal Justice, um, the Council for Court Excellence, CCE. They have some of those reports on their website. We also have them on ours. If folks want to learn more about these issues in the district, and because these are publicly funded systems, I really hope that everybody does. They should look at this. The Council of Criminal Justice is also starting to publish monthly reports about justice so people can understand that data, understand the systems contributing to it. Like you, I just want people to be really informed about these systems. They take the lion's share of our local resources, and those are supported through tax dollars. Wonderful. Okay. Well, now feel like, you know, this is a home uh, for you to get the message out. We certainly look forward to talking to you more in the future. 
Uh, we put the website up. Uh, I know that you uh, you said you people have to send a, a letter of interest mm -hmm. if they have a program or project or something that they want funding. They would reach out to you at that website, publicwelfare.org, and um, you all will take it from there. Thank you so much. Thank you for everything that you do. I appreciate you. Thank you. All righty. Have a good one. You too. Bye-bye. Uh, you know, we talked, we had uh, earlier, you know, we talked about that earned income tax credit. I call it money in the couch or change in the car. Uh, Public Welfare Foundation, there's big money uh, on the couch, not in the couch, it's on the couch. So all we got to do is fill out that letter of intent, uh, write a letter of intent and let, let them know if you have a program uh, that you think is worthy of funding in the areas that specific focus, as Candace told us, you know, don't don't go in there talking about, you know, if you can't tie it to that focus, then you, are, you know that you may not be successful. So anyway, last but not least, I am so really excited to have uh, my friend and a good, a real trooper, not only in, uh, I guess, the um, public safety realm, but also uh, when it comes to contractors for minority businesses, Rosalind Stiles. Uh, welcome to uh, Let's Talk. Roz, how are you? Hi, Denise. It is so good to have this conversation with you today. Good. good. It's, uh, it's right. You're right. We've been we've been around a minute. We've oh, seen yeah. new things in our neighborhoods. <laughs> and so I've always tried to create programs and services that can help people who look like us, walk like us, talk like us, and live in our communities. Is Dottie so, Love Wade? Is she with Dottie's not with us? Okay. All right. So not, it's you and me. She's not on? No, no. She's okay. not here. So all it's right. all you. Okay. All right. So, Ross, tell let folks. I know you know everybody in DC knows who you are, but you know, <laughs> uh, for for that one person who's like, who is she? Tell us a little bit about you know, kind of the work that you've been doing over the years and how you got focused on uh, this new initiative. Well, it's not new anymore, but Jobs Not Guns initiative. But how did that translate from what you were doing in the field of business and minority and contracting? Doing in, the, in the construction business. Yeah. So the first thing is, as you know, I was I was born and raised right here in Anacostia. I tell everybody when the time they built the South Capitol Street Bridge is the same year that I was born. <laughs> so um, in, in terms of Anacostia, Ray went to um, went to Moton Elementary, Douglas Junior High, graduated from Ballou Senior High. I even attended, um, I even attended Federal City College before it became the University of the District of Columbia. So DC, Southeast, Anacostia is in my blood. And one of the things that I have is being raised by two parents, seven boys and two girls, is that we were raised at, in a community. I don't care what people think about Anacostia, about Southeast, about Congress Heights, about East of the River, as we are referred to now. It is a very thriving community. And it was, and it's always been that way. And so coming up, I was able to do some things that other people may not have experienced. I was able to, after graduation and working in the community by community uh, enforcers, um, advocates that took me everywhere, taught me everything, the Teresa Jones of the world. And so I kind of was raised in community activism. So I found myself and in the early years of being able to apply for a job in, in um, for the Peace Corps and travel overseas. I actually served with the Peace Corps for, for five, six years. I never knew that, wow. Yeah, and, and what it did, it exposed me to other cultures. And, and when I came back, you know, being rah rah, you know, DC and all, I said, if I can help people in the third world country, I certainly can help people here in my country and in my neighborhood. So that was kind of the catalyst that keeps me empowered. Well, in terms of the, of the, con the construction building trades, Marion Barry said to me one day, because, you know, I introduced the bridal industry, you know, from an economic perspective. But one thing that, that the mayor said to me, he said, Rosalind, these contractors are trying to come to Anacostia and, build, and to build some apartments. He said, 
go see what they're doing and why they're doing it. Well, when I talked to them, they did have a plan, but the plan did not include the, the residents of the district. Mm. They did not include our uh, hiring our contractors. It did not include hiring our residents. And I was I'm like, sure oh, he, you can't come across this bridge if you're not going to leave something here. If I'm you, sure if he, we can be a part of it. Right. I'm sure Marion being, Mayor Barry being the man that he was knew that. And I'm yeah, sure exactly. he knew what he was doing when he sent you after them. <laughs> so, yeah, he sent me after him. And so what I did is I sat down with the community and I sat down with the developer and we came up with a memorandum of understanding. And it will, it, and because they showed us, we had to take the residents to see what they have done in other neighborhoods to see how we the, the city could benefit. And we found out that they were willing to sign a memorandum of understanding with us, with the community, in terms of, of deliverables. We will help you to build this process, but that you've got to make sure that our contractors get hired. You need to make sure that our residents can have opportunities. So they created an investment fund for the community, as well as gave them preferences around the uh, around the development project itself. And so that's that, where all of this started. That's where it started. The the MOU doing. started with the first uh, private program, pr private event, and and that was on Good Hope Road, and um, and it actually was the catalyst for me starting Capital City Associates because I was working on the very first unified communication center that was being built. Mm, working yes. with the ANC, we created a mem memorandum of understanding on a DC funded project. The, the DC always had a goal, 35% participation. That project, because of the MOU with the community, it moved the, the um, requirement from a goal to a to being met, being um, um, requirement. So that was the difference. It was a difference from saying, I'm going to try and do it and you have to do it. And so that was the precedent that moved us to, that moved me and the community to making sure that every contract that was let to a contractor had 35% participation for the construction and had 30 and 40% participation by district district residents, and I'm you know I'm very proud of that 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 whole system became a requirement and became very active. Well, that's why I wanted you to tell to tell that story because when we talk about jobs, not guns, you know, initiative. A lot of there are a lot of initiatives out there that you know uh, don't actually produce results. They're great. You know, uh, <laughs> they, they feel good. But, you know, when you talk about jobs, you are one who helped to create job opportunities. Exactly. And so, yeah. So how, how did you transition from that, from expand. what you're still doing? Expand. Thank <laughs> you. Expand from what you're doing yeah. to well, this new initiative. You know, I'm a part of the East of the River Public Safety, Public Safety Consortium, which is 40 about well, 40 um, organizations that operate in East of the River or provide support East of the River. When the mayor created the DC Office of Gun Violence Prevention, three of our organizations came together and said, we can help her do this. And so we came up with the concept of creating Jobs Not Guns. Jobs Not Guns is a three-pronged approach to gun, to gun, to, uh, to approach to um, preventing gun, gun violence. The first thing is, is that, is that recruitment fairs don't work. Job, job fairs don't work. The, our people go to the job fairs and they don't get a job okay. and they don't understand why. Yeah. It's because you might have barriers to employment. So not only do we have to address what jobs are out there, meaningful careers are out there, but what do we need to do? What tools do we need in order for our residents to qualify? And so we have, so the three-prong approach is that we provide employment opportunities. We provide training. A lot of training program goes on, but a, a lot of our residents and, and our young people don't know where the training is. So we provide the training so that they'll know where that is. And the other thing is that some of our residents and youth have barriers personal barriers. So we, we provide support services. So those are the three aspects of jobs, not guns. 
Robin, is that, why why not why that title? Why jobs not guns? What what are you, what was the the you thought know, behind it? Is, yeah, for, it for was using because, that title. Yeah, because what we're trying to what we're trying to promote is that we should have we should em, empower our young people, our residents and young people to uh, to support a job. A job does not mean being a cashier at at McDonald's. A career means that it being in the Air Force, being in in the police department, being in in the housing industry. There are so many careers that we that we understand and that are out there, but they don't see that those careers. They're not exposed to those careers. And so when they hear about it, they the first thing they say, well, that's not for me, or I get turned down, or I get turned away. I don't even get to the table. And so what we try to do is to is to identify careers and then help them. We provide the resources to help them get through those careers. How did I, how did I get started in the building trades? Is because of the apprenticeship program. Mm. That's a career builder. Right. And then, and and the, what I had to I had to respond to was everybody kept saying, "Oh, they're just flag men. Oh, they're just you know st- street sweepers and all." That's absolutely not true. the The building trades, their apprenticeship programs would help you with a career. We have like as our speakers and all, we have in the community a young man who at five years old was out there being a lookout for the drug dealers. And he ended up as a teenager in, in, incarcerated. When he came out, he said, there's got to be a different way to work, I mean, to, to live, because I don't think I'm going to live very long. So some he was recruited into the building trades. He is now the regional manager for, East, for, for the Eastern region of, of the Carpenters Union. Wow. He is now, he That's tells it. people, I went from the streets to a sixth figure job. How did he do that? Because the union provided him a salary, benefits, housing, all kinds, you know, they kept him working. And now he is a region, Maryland, DC, Northern Virginia. That's a, that's a great testimony to the program. And that's one of the things that we always like to see, you know, the proof is in, in the stories. Exactly. Um, so I know you're having an event that's coming up soon. Can you give us the details and also who some of the uh, partners are that are working with? Okay. You? Well, the, uh, the partners that created Jobs Not Gun is Inner Thoughts Incorporated, my organization, which is the National Association of Minority Contractors, the DC chapter, and the Black Business Owners, and we're all, like I said, members of the consortium. And what we've done, we've had, we've had 10 events since, since the Office of Gun Violence started. And we have been supporting them in, in helping to get the word out. One of the things that I like about this, the last two presenters is they all talked about support services and collaboration. Those are two key elements. We have to work together. If there is support and services out there, they can't apply if they don't know about it. And so what we try to do is to provide that information. So on the 24th of this month in April, at, in the Panorama Room, we, we tried to focus this one because we've had two youth workshops, but we try to focus this one on East of the River because in our, I'm on the one of the community, the, the criminal justice advisory committees. And one of the things that we continue to hear from the police department and from the, the, uh, the, the federal office of, of justice, and especially from, from the, um, the, the report that came out, the, the last one about the criminal justice coordinating council, they mm-hmm. talk about East of the river being a, a you know, almost a hellhole, but everybody's killing everybody. You know, and I know better than that. Oh, that yeah. We have wonderful programs. We have wonderful services. So what we decided this time is to condense. We're not excluding anybody, but we're going to our schools, our senior high schools, east of the river in Ward 7 and 8. And we're saying to them, bring us your students, the ones that are seen, that are in high school, that are looking for developing careers, that are getting ready to graduate and move off, move on. These, we want to be able to give them the process 
the procedures, the account, all of those tools that they're going to need when they in, in establishing career, how to do it, and then what they can do moving forward. The good news is, is that we have a, an abundance of resources in east, east of the river. Oh, yeah. We, People think that we are a, a desert right, as right. it relates to, you know, support and service and opportunities. So we've invited the programs and services and the federal and district agencies to come and, and share with our young people. These are the resources that are available in your neighborhood. Our employment not only talks about a job, but what are the employers saying about what you need in terms of qualification? The employers will tell them why they're not going to be hired, how they look, how they articulate themselves, how they prepare resume to prepare them for career building. So what the, what's the date? Oh, you gave us the date and the time. Can you give us okay, that? Okay, it's going to be in at the Panorama, you know, Our Lady Perpetual Health Church in the Panorama Room. And that's April the 24th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Okay. We, our community, our committee, we UPO provides transportation. We go to the schools. We pick up the kids. We bring, I'm sorry, our youth, and bring them to the event. We give them the panel. We give them the resources. We give them breakfast. We give them lunch. <laughs> we have a fun day. So, so Roz, you know, what one of the challenges that the school systems are dealing with right now is the whole issue of truancy. And so, you know, there's gonna be a lot, there are a lot of kids. You'll have you'll have kids that are in school, but what about those that hear about this, but they just don't welcome. happen to be there? Okay. We, because All right. our, our, our profile, you know where they should be in yes, school, you know, yes, below our and school. Is any youth 16 to 24 for the youth workshop. Okay. 15 All to right. 24 is our is our basic age range. And now mind you, this is the third one. We've had two that were citywide. Okay. We've already had two that were citywide. And the thing, the good thing about this one is that we also will be doing follow-up beyond the actual event. Yeah, that's one amazing. That we didn't do, and I'm going to be calling Public Welfare Foundation <laughs> and saying we need to be able to track a to, to have the resources to track and monitor the success of their participation. Right. Data. Yeah, and, and, and we would want you to come back to us and talk about those successes. Exactly. I mean, you, you gave us one example, which I think is uh, a great one and exciting, but, you know, we'd love to know more uh, so that we can highlight, you know, give those, those young people the same kind of publicity that the folks that are doing destructive things in our community get. Exactly. They get a lot of publicity. They you know, good do. kids don't. Yeah. And yeah. so what they just need to understand is that they they think that the, the public thinks because they're in this environment that they are automatically going to be involved in gun violence and drug activities. We're addressing those those activities to see how we can get them to prevent the the participation in drug activities and gun violence. That's what that's what our mainstay is, is that is to give them the things that are out there ahead of time so that they can make good decisions moving forward. For those that have already been in the system, we all have we also have testimonials of where you are now and how you can overcome and become a a new Kunte Bedne who is now a six figure person. You see. Wow. So you have the best of both worlds. What do you need to do to establish your roadmap? And what do you need to do to overcome any challenges that you have now, be that drugs or, or gun violence or whatever, how we can help you to overcome those barriers and become productive citizens to provide for yourself and your family. You can't fault people a lot of times if they don't know. So all of these resources that are here we are trying to share it with them. We're sharing it with the whole community, not just east of the river. But you know what, what we're saying is, you all come to the workshop. We'll give you some pointers for from employers, from training programs, from people who have been there and done that. That's one of our, you know, who who knows the system and how to overcome it. And then the resource tables, Department of Employment Services, other employing agencies other support programs, the, the doctor who was there, she's right. Housing, 
mental health, drug addiction, all of those are challenges. So, but you need to know where to go. Right. And right. so we can't do it. That's not what we do, but we certainly can provide you the information of where to go to get the help. Well, I think, you know, just, just from what I've observed over the last couple of years by attending the event that you had at the, um, the Armory? National, yeah, the Armory last year. And just your words, you know, I think let young folks know who need to know, you know, that people care. You know, you're doing oh, this Lord, not, yeah. not for a contract and not for, you know, you're doing it because you legitimately care. This is your neighborhood. You grew up here. You understand uh, what the possibilities can be. And you're trying to help them to see that as well. And I think people will get that uh, if they're there. If they're there. If they're there. <laughs> if they're there. So we, you know, we're still recruiting, you know, students, if they, you know, young people, whether they're in school or out of school, recreation programs, if they're incarcerated in a in and they are in a workforce program. I mean, what we're trying to do is to help the young people to overcome any barriers to employment. That's Wonderful. our goal. Is that you know, wherever you are, let's start there and then help you with a, pro, a, a plan for three months after the event, we'll be in contact with them and say, where are you? What are your challenges? Did the people you talk to, did they give you, did you, are you started? Have you done it? And, and then go back to say, excuse me, you told them that you were going to help them. Now they told me they ain't heard from you. Yeah. They need advocates. Exactly. Well, I want to thank you. We've gone way over, but I thought well, it was I do to do that. You know, I, I just want to get after, the story out. After all of the needs, this is our hood. This is uh, our neighborhood. <laughs> we got to take care of our kids in our neighborhood now. No question. No question. And I appreciate you having me and the Jobs Not Gun initiatives on the call, on the on the show. And yes, we would love to come back and talk in collaboration with other programs and services in helping to prevent gun gun violence and and drug addiction in our community. Well, that's a play. That's a, a plan and a date. We'll set that up. And, okay, uh, yeah. So Thank you so much. I'm wishing you a great event, and uh, we'll probably be there. So we'll talk about that later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All righty. All right. Bye bye. Thank you. That mm -hmm. was uh, Rosalind Stiles with Jobs Not Guns and a real community advocate. I want to thank you all for watching. Let's talk. We've had. If, you know, had some great discussions today with a lot of insight and information. We want to extend a special thanks to Dr. Courtney Johnson Rose uh, and well, others that were here on the show and um, uh, yeah, Rosalind Stiles and of course the information from CAB and the doctor. Um, we certainly know that um, it's important for us to share this information. And we want you, you know, you can watch this later on on our YouTube channel, share it with folks if they're a segment that you think uh, folks need to see, but they weren't able to watch. You can go on YouTube and get that segment and share it with them as well. So for now, I just want to say have a great weekend. It's the Cherry Blossom Parade tomorrow. If you're coming, I'll see you there. It's, uh, other than the MLK Parade, it's my favorite parade. So I will be there tomorrow. And I hope that you all have a great weekend. I'm Denise Rollard Barnes signing off. Ah, thank you, Chevry. I'm so sorry. I cannot leave without talking about immense, the Emancipation Day Parade. You know, you have an exit and then you have to, it's, it's a revolving door. I had to come back in again to say not only the Cherry Blossom Parade on uh, Saturday morning, the 13th, but Emancipation Day Parade on April the 14th. And that's going to be not only parade, it's a concert, all of this at Freedom Plaza, fireworks, everything's going to take place down at Freedom Plaza on set on Sunday. Make sure you come starting at two o'clock. Uh, it's going to be, I, I, I heard uh, Latoya Foster from the Office of uh, Cable Television, Film, Music and Entertainment. Uh, she shared in, uh, details with us. It's going to be a great event. So make sure you put that on your calendar and I'll see you there as well. Have a great weekend.